Hello viewers. Welcome to Seek Wisdom. Today, we are here with the summary of Blink, The Power of Thinking Without Thinking by Malcolm Gladwell. Blink will help you understand every decision you make. Never again will you think about thinking the same way. Blink is a book about how we think without thinking, about choices that seem to be made in an instant in the blink of an eye that actually aren't as simple as they seem. Hope you like it. Let's get started. In September 1983, an art dealer approached Getty Museum in California saying, he is in possession of a marble statue dating from 6th century BC asking price of $10 million. Getty took it on rent for investigation and took it to geologist, who after examining a specimen from the statue told that the statue was old. Getty convinced and was about to buy it, soon then Federico Z who was in Getty Board of Trustees, then Evelyn Harrison, another expert on Greek sculptures, Thomas Hoving, former director of Metropolitan Museum of Art, felt the statue didn't look right. The chorus of dismay was getting louder and detailed analysis begin. At the end, it was concluded that the statue along with the documents was fake. In the first two seconds of looking in a single glance they were able to understand more about the essence of the statue than the team at the Getty was able to understand after 14 months. Blink is a book about those first two seconds. Our brain uses two very different strategies to make sense of the situation. The first is the one we're most familiar with. It's the conscious strategy. We think about what we've learned and eventually we come up with an answer. This strategy is logical and definitive. It's slow, and it needs a lot of information. There's a second strategy, though. It operates a lot more quickly. It's a system in which our brain reaches conclusions without immediately telling us that it's reaching conclusions. The part of our brain that leaps to conclusions like this is called the adaptive unconscious. The adaptive unconscious does an excellent job of sizing up the world, warning people of danger, setting goals, and initiating action in a sophisticated and efficient manner. Whenever we meet someone for the first time, whenever we interview someone for a job, whenever we're faced with making a decision quickly and under stress, we use that second part of our brain. What do we tell our children? Haste makes waste. But there are moments particularly in times of stress, when haste does not make waste, when our snap judgments and first impressions can offer a much better means of making sense of the world. It's not the case that our internal computer always shines through, instantly decoding the truth of a situation. It can be thrown off, distracted, and disabled. So, when should we trust our instincts, and when should we be wary of them? Answering that question is the second task of Blink. To make an accurate prediction about something as serious as the future of a marriage indeed. To make a prediction of any sort it seems that we would have to gather a lot of information and in as many different contexts as possible. But psychologist named John Gottman can predict whether a relation will stay or break up just within 15 minutes with a success rate of 90%. How? He made the couple sit in his lab and tell them to discuss any topic from their marriage that had become a point of contention. The couple's interaction is recorded with the help of cameras and some instruments. This 15 minute video is then analyzed by emotions of each person each second. Based on the ratio of positive and negative emotions, the future of their relation was predicted. This concept is called thin slicing. Thin slicing refers to the ability of our unconscious to find patterns in situations and behavior based on very narrow slices of experience. How is it possible to gather the necessary information for a sophisticated judgment in such a short time? The answer is that when our unconscious engages in thin slicing, what we are doing is an automated, accelerated unconscious version of what Gottman does with his videotapes and equations. Similarly thin slicing was applied for recruitment to know about the person, by just looking at his room condition and answering a questionnaire. Many similar examples are provided in the book. Thin slicing is not an exotic gift. It is a central part of what it means to be human. 
we thin slice because we have to, and we come to rely on that ability because there are lots of hidden fists out there, lots of situations where careful attention to the details of a very thin slice, even for no more than a second or two, can tell us an awful lot. After thin slicing, snap judgments a second critical fact about the thoughts and decisions that bubble up from our unconscious. Snap judgments and rapid cognition take place behind the locked door of the brain. We are not very good at dealing with the fact of that locked door. It's one thing to acknowledge the enormous power of snap judgments and thin slices, but quite another to place our trust in something so seemingly mysterious. Our world requires that decisions be sourced and footnoted, and if we say how we feel, we must also be prepared to elaborate on why we feel that way. If we are to learn to improve the quality of the decisions we make, we need to accept the mysterious nature of our snap judgments. We need to respect the fact that it is possible to know without knowing why we know and accept that sometimes, we're better off that way. Experiments have proved that, what we think of as free will is largely an illusion. Much of the time, we are simply operating on automatic pilot. And the way we think and act and how well we think and act on the spur of the moment are a lot more susceptible to outside influences than we realize. We have a storytelling problem. We're a bit too quick to come up with explanations for things we don't really have an explanation for. When we ask people to explain their thinking, particularly thinking that comes from the unconscious, we need to be careful in how we interpret their answers. When it comes to romance, we know we cannot rationally describe the kind of person we will fall in love with, that's why we go on dates to test our theories about who attracts us. We learn by example and by direct experience because there are real limits to the adequacy of verbal instruction. Experiments show that people are ignorant of the things that affect their actions, yet they rarely feel ignorant. We need to accept our ignorance and say I don't know more often. Thin slicing possible is our ability to very quickly get below the surface of a situation. But sometimes situations carry so many powerful connotations that it stops the normal process of thinking dead in its tracks. Here the snap judgments fails. It's why picking the right candidate for a job is so difficult. Part of what it means to take thin slicing and first impressions seriously is accepting the fact that sometimes we can know more about someone or something in the blink of an eye than we can. After months of study, our attitudes toward things like race or gender operate on two levels. First of all, we have our conscious attitudes. This is what we choose to believe. These are our stated values, which we use to direct our behavior deliberately. Our second level of attitude, our racial attitude on an unconscious level the immediate, automatic associations that tumble out before we've even had time to think. We don't deliberately choose our unconscious attitudes. The giant computer that is our unconscious silently crunches all the data it can from the experiences we've had, the people we've met, the lessons we've learned, the books we've read, the movies we've seen, and so on and it forms an opinion. Studies show that our unconscious attitudes may be utterly incompatible with our stated conscious values. You don't choose to make positive associations with a dominant group, but you are required to. All around you, that group is being paired with good things. You open the newspaper and you turn on the television, and you can't escape it. The kinds of biases we're talking about here aren't so obvious that it's easy to identify a solution. The answer is that we are not helpless in the face of our first impressions. Our first impressions are generated by our experiences and our environment. Which means that we can change our first impressions we can alter the way we thin slice by changing the experiences that comprise those impressions. If you are a white person who would like to treat black people as equals in every way who would like to have a set of associations with blacks that are as positive as those that you have with whites it requires more than a simple commitment to equality. It requires that you change your life so that you are exposed to minorities on a regular basis and become comfortable with them and familiar with the best of their culture. So that when you want to meet, hire, date 
or talk with a member of a minority, you are betrayed by your hesitation and discomfort. Recognizing someone's face is a classic example of unconscious cognition. We don't have to think about it. Faces just pop into our minds. But suppose you were asked to take a pen and paper and write down in as much detail as you can what your person looks like. Describe her face. What color was her hair? What was she wearing? Was she wearing any jewelry? Believe it or not, you will now do a lot worse at picking that face out of a lineup. This is because the act of describing a face has the effect of impairing your effortless ability to subsequently recognize that face. Your left brain has a part that thinks in words, and a right part that thinks in pictures, and what happened when you described the face in words was that your actual visual memory was displaced. Your thinking was bumped from the right to the left hemisphere. As human beings, we are capable of extraordinary leaps of insight and instinct. We can hold a face in memory, and we can solve a puzzle in a flash. But all these abilities are incredibly fragile. Insight is not a light bulb that goes off inside our heads. It is a flickering candle that can easily be snuffed out. There are two important lessons here. The first is that, truly successful decision making relies on a balance between deliberate and instinctive thinking. Bob Gollum is a great car salesman because he is very good, in the moment, at intuiting the intentions and needs and emotions of his customers. But he is also a great salesman because he understands when to put the brakes on that process, which is a particular kind of snap judgment. Deliberate thinking is a wonderful tool when we have the luxury of time, the help of a computer, and a clearly defined task. And the fruits of that type of analysis can set the stage for rapid cognition. The second lesson is that in good decision making, frugality matters. John Gottman took a complex problem and reduced it to its simplest elements. He showed that even the most complicated of relationships and problems have an identifiable underlying pattern. When we thin slice, when we recognize patterns and make snap judgments, we do this process of editing unconsciously. And if you are given too many choices, if you are forced to consider much more than your unconscious is comfortable with, you get paralyzed. Snap judgments can be made in a snap because they are frugal, and if we want to protect our snap judgments, we have to take steps to protect that frugality. When we talk about analytic versus intuitive decision making, neither is good or bad. What is bad is, if you use either of them in an inappropriate circumstance. While people are very willing and very good at volunteering information explaining their actions, those explanations, particularly when it comes to the kinds of spontaneous opinions and decisions that arise out of the unconscious, aren't necessarily correct. So, when marketers ask consumers to give them their reactions to something to explain whether they liked a song that was just played or a movie they just saw or a politician they just heard how much trust should be placed in their answers. Finding out what people think of a rock song sounds as if it should be easy. But the truth is that it isn't. The Pepsi challenge to Coke in 80s is a really good illustration. However, in Pepsi challenge, people were given sip to give judgment. However, when same people are given the product to take home and provide their feedback later, the response was totally opposite. The Edsel, the Ford Motor Company's famous flop from the 1950s, failed because people thought it looked funny. But two or three years later, every other car maker didn't suddenly start making cars that looked like the Edsel. The Edsel started out ugly, and it's still ugly. By the same token, there are movies that people hate when they see them for the first time, and they still hate them two or three years later. A bad movie is always a bad movie. The problem is, the things that we hate is a class of products that are in that category only because they are weird. They make us nervous. They are sufficiently different that it takes us some time to understand that we actually like them. Our unconscious reactions come out of a locked room and we can't look inside that room. 
But with experience we can become experts at using our behavior and our training to interpret and decode what lies behind our snap judgments and first impressions. It's a lot like what people do when they are in psychoanalysis. They spend years analyzing their unconscious with the help of a trained therapist until they begin to get a sense of how their mind works. The most common and the most important forms of rapid cognition are the judgments and the impressions we form of other people. Every waking minute that we are in the presence of someone, we come up with a constant stream of predictions and influences about what that person is thinking and feeling. When someone says, I love you, we look into that person's eyes to judge his or her sincerity. When we meet someone new, we often pick up on subtle signals, so that afterward, even though he or she may have talked in a normal and friendly manner, we may say, I don't think he liked me. Or I don't think she's very happy. We easily parse complex distinctions in facial expression. This practice of inferring the motivations and intentions of others is classic thin slicing. It is picking up on subtle cues in order to read someone's mind and there is almost no other impulse so basic and so automatic and at which, most of the time, we so effortlessly excel. Mind reading failures happen to all of us. They lie at the root of countless arguments, disagreements, misunderstandings, and hurt feelings. And yet, because these failures are so instantaneous and so mysterious, we don't really know how to understand them. The face is an enormously rich source of information about emotion. The information on our face is what is going on inside our mind. We can all mind read effortlessly and automatically because the clues we need are right there on the faces of those in front of us. We may not be able to read faces as brilliantly. But there is enough accessible information on a face to make everyday mind reading possible. A baby looks into your eyes when you cup your hands over hers because she knows she can find an explanation in your face. Our mind, faced with a life-threatening situation, drastically limits the range and amount of information that we have to deal with. Sound and memory and broader social understanding are sacrificed in favor of heightened awareness of the threat directly in front of us. But what happens when this stress response is taken to an extreme? Most of us, under pressure, get too aroused, and past a certain point, that our bodies begin shutting down so many sources of information that we start to become useless. After our heartbeat crosses 145, bad things begin to happen. Complex motor skills start to break down. At 175, we begin to see an absolute breakdown of cognitive processing. The forebrain shuts down, and the midbrain reaches up and hijacks the forebrain. Arousal leaves us mind blind. Our extreme arousal and mind blindness are inevitable under conditions of stress. Of course not. With practice, this can be controlled. When people, like policemen, are trained in a stressful environment, then the sudden rise in their heartbeat is found to be falling with each such encounter. Those who had shown 175 heartbeat in stress found to have 120 after a few months of practice in similar environment. Mind reading, as well, is an ability that improves with practice. Every moment every blink is composed of a series of discrete moving parts, and every one of those parts offers an opportunity for intervention, for reform, and for correction. The conclusion is. We are often careless with our powers of rapid cognition. We don't know where our first impressions come from or precisely what they mean, so we don't always appreciate their fragility. Taking our powers of rapid cognition seriously means we have to acknowledge the subtle influences that can alter or undermine or bias the products of our unconscious. Too often we are resigned to what happens in the blink of an eye. It doesn't seem like we have much control over whatever bubbles to the surface from our unconscious. But we do, and if we can control the environment in which rapid cognition takes place, then we can control rapid cognition. We can prevent the people fighting wars or staffing emergency rooms or policing the streets from making mistakes. Here we will wind up the video. Hope you have enjoyed it. If you like this video, 
please hit the like button and share with your friends. We are eager to have your feedback on our efforts. Please subscribe this channel for more such videos and hit the bell icon to be updated for the latest updates.